Hello students, in, in this video, we will be covering paper 10444, the topic on logic of regional integrations, types and levels, significance of regional integration as a strategy for the periphery, and we'll understand the case studies of EU, OPEC, ASEAN, SARC, and BRICS. So to start with, uh, what is the logic of regional integrations? We will understand. Uh, so regional integration is a process in which neighboring countries enter into an agreement in order to upgrade cooperation through common institutions and rules. So the major objective over here of regional in integration is there is an agreement that could range from economic to political to environmental, wherein uh, two or more countries are agreeing to some or the other kind of corporation so that there is free flow of goods, services, and so on. The regional integration simply is a process by which states within a particular region increase their level of interaction uh, with regard to the economic, security, political, or social and cultural issues. So it is basically an integration uh, between a number of countries by coming up with a particular agreement. Now, uh, regional integration initiatives, according to Van Legenhoff, uh, has to fulfill the eight important functions. So when there is re regional integration, what are the important functions that would ful fulfill? And from there, we, it would be seen that the regional integrations have taken place. So the first one is the strengthening of trade integration in the particular region over here. Uh, then second, the, cert the creation of an appropriate enabling environment for private sector development. So that will be taken care in the integration. The development of infrastructure programs in support of economic growth and regional integration so that the region also grows and the country also develops. The development of strong public sector institutions and good governance. Then the fifth one, the reduction of social exclusion and the development of an inclusive civil society. Then there has to be a contribution to peace and security in the region. Uh, the seventh one is the building of environment programs at the regional level. And the eighth one, eighth function would be the strengthening of regions interaction with other regions of the world. So all this is basically are the important functions so that there is regional integration uh, taking place. Now, there are several types and levels of regional integration we will understand. Uh, the first one is free trade. So there are tariffs, uh, basically the tax imposed on important, imported goods when they are basically sent from one country to the another country. So uh, between member countries are significantly reduced and some are abolished altogether. So if there is a regional integration, such taxes will actually be free. Uh, maybe there would be a free trade or these taxes would be completely abolished between the members. Okay. And each member country keeps its tariffs regarding the third countries over here. All right. Then the second one is there will be a custom union. Uh, it sets common external tariffs among member countries, implying that same tariffs are applied to third countries. A common trade regime is achieved and the custom unions are particularly useful to the level of competitive playing fields and address the problems of re-exports using preferential tariffs in one country to enter into another country. So the, basically there is a union which will look into all these different kinds of problems. And then there is a common market. The services and capital are free to move within member countries expanding the scale economies and comparative advantage. Uh, but uh, here, each national market has its regulation, such as there is a product standard over here. All right. Uh, then uh, economic union, uh, which basically means the single market, uh, the all tariffs are removed from trade between member countries, uh, creating a uniform single market. So basically, there is a single market. And there are also free movements of labor enabling workers in in member country to move and work in another member country smoothly. So uh, mem uh, workers can work in the other countries, you can say, providing if there is a cooperation over here or there is a regional integration. The monetary and fiscal policies between the member countries are harmonized, which implies a level of political integration. And the further step concerns a monetary union where a common currency is used. Uh, like, for an example, if, the, if we take the example of European Union, 
दे हैव अ कॉमन करेंसी विच इज दी यूरोज ओवर दे the next one is political union uh, which means that it represents the potentially most advanced form of integration within a common government and where the sovereignty of the member country is significantly reduced only found within uh, nation states such as federations where there is a central government and regions or we can say the provinces states having a level of autonomy over here uh then uh, we can understand the significance of these regional uh, integration with the help of certain case studies uh, now this regional integration is a strategy for the periphery it is important it is significant so we can understand it from the various uh, regional integrations that has taken place in the form of trade blocks uh, like the eu that is european union opec okay organization of petroleum exporting countries acn sarc and brics so we will understand each of them one by one uh so in the past decade there have been an increase in the trading blocks uh, with more than 100 agreements in place and more in the discussion so what is a trade block a trade block is a free trade zone or near tra free trade zone formed by one or more tax tariff and trade agreement between two or more countries over there so it is an agreement basically you can say wherein there is an involvement of two or more countries and they agree on various aspects so these agreement create more opportunities for countries to trade with one another by removing the barriers of trade and investment over there all right uh, due to reduction on uh, or removal of tariffs cooperation results in cheaper prices for consumers in the block countries over here right uh, the regional economic integration significantly contributes to relatively high growth rates in the less developed countries so it will be it is quite beneficial for the less developed and the developing countries since there is more amount of cooperation over here all right so by removing restrictions on labor movement economic integration this can help in the job opportunities also in the lesser developed countries so uh, basically this kind of regional integration is basically a strategy for the peripheral areas or the nearby countries who would benefit so we will first understand the european union uh, the european union is a political and economic union uh, which consists of 27 member states that are located primarily in europe okay uh when we talk about the european union policies it aims to ensure the free movement of people goods and services and capital within the internal market enact legislation and justices and home affairs and maintain common policies on trade agriculture fisheries and regional development the european union is the largest trade bloc in the world and it is the world's biggest exporter of manufactured goods and services and the biggest import market for over 100 countries so we can see over here that european union is one of the biggest you can say in terms of trade blocks so there is a free trade among its members and is one of the european union's founding principles that they are doing free trade between these member countries beyond its borders the european union is also committed to liberalizing the world trade over here so the removing of more and more trade barriers and creating more free trade zone internal trade between the member states is aided by the removal of barriers to trade such as tariff and border controls okay and in the eurozone the trade is helped by not having any currency differences to deal among the most members so as it was been said earlier also that they have a common currency that is the euros then we come to the next one that is opec organization of petroleum exporting countries so this organization is actually a permanent intergovernmental organization uh, which was actually created in baghdad conference in 1960 uh, by iraq iran kuwait saudi arabia and venezuela its first five member countries okay so the uh, the first four are majorly the middle east countries wherein uh, more amount of petroleum is being found and also the venezuela which which is basically having the largest petroleum reserves currently the other member countries of opec are algeria angola congo equatorial guinea uh, gabon libya nigeria and the united arab emirates so uh, majorly the african countries over here are also the other members included in the opec altogether the organization has uh, 13 members 
ओके एंड एज ऑफ सेप्टेम्बर टू थाउजेंड एटीन दर्टीन में अकाउंटेड फॉर अबाउट फोर्टी फोर परसेंट ऑफ द ग्लोबल ऑयल प्रोडक्शन एंड एटी वन पॉइंट फाइव परसेंट ऑफ द वर्ल्ड प्रूवन ऑयल रिजर्व गिविंग ओपेक मेजर इन्फ्लुएंस ऑन द ग्लोबल ऑयल प्राइजेज ओवर सो सिंस दीज आर द मेजर कंट्रीज विच हैव मेजर अमाउंट्स ऑफ ऑयल रिजर्व सो दे कैन बी वन ऑफ द मेजर इन्फ्लुएंस फॉर द ग्लोबल ऑयल प्राइजेज ऑल ओवर द वर्ल्ड सो दीज आर द मेजर थर्टीन कंट्रीज ओके and uh, when we talk about its head headquarters the headquarters of opec are located in vienna in austria uh, since 1965 now the mission of opec is basically to contribute and unify in the petroleum uh, policies of its member countries and ensure the stabilization of oil markets to secure an efficient economic and regular supply of petroleum to the consumers over here and there is a steady income to producers and a fair return on capital for those investing in the petroleum industry over here so they are major focus is basically the stabilization of the oil prices in the international market the organization is also a significant provider of information about international oil market the formation of opec marked a turning point towards the national sovereignty over natural resources and opec decisions have come to a play a prominent role in the global oil market and the international relations over here all right the effect can be particularly seen strong when the wars or civil disorder led to extended interruptions of supply so there uh, there have been cases in the past wherein there were certain civil wars taking place in the middle east countries and which had led to the uh you know uh, disruption or problems related to the supply of oil prices so here there is a uh, major interference or we can say there is a major uh, you can say trade uh, agreements taking place over here so these countries the opec therefore helps if there are such kind of disruptions and if there is some shortage in the supply due to such kind of war so this is majorly helped by the availability of the trade flow then we come to the next one that is the association of southeast asian nations so it is actually an economic union comprising of 10 member states in southeast asia which promotes intergovernmental cooperation between its members and other countries in asia so it is associated to asia uh, it was established on 8th august 1967 in bangkok thailand uh, with the signing of the asean declaration or also known as the bangkok declaration by the founding fathers of asia uh the founding fathers are actually indonesia uh, malaysia philippines singapore and thailand and uh, later on it was the brunei vietnam laos uh, myanmar and cambodia who joined the uh, this particular the 10 member association so all these are the southeast asian countries if, if it has been seen or observed now asian's primary objective was to accelerate economic growth and throughout that social progress and cultural development in the uh, southeast asian region over here all right and uh, what is their secondary objective over here was to promote regional peace and stability based on the rule of law and the principle of united nations charter so with some of the fastest growing economies in the world asean has broadened its objective beyond the economic and the social spheres it was been seen that in 2003 asean moved along the path of european union by agreeing to establish an asean community comprising three pillars and these three pillars included the asean security community the economic community and the socio cultural community and under the uh, asean free trade area which was established on 10/28 january 1992 it includes a common effective preferential tariff cept to promote the free flow of goods between the member states over here between the ten countries okay. asean countries have many economic zones like the industrial parks uh, eco industrial park special economic zone technology parks and innovation districts and it has been seen that in 2018 eight of the asean members are among the world's outperforming economies with positive long term prospects for the region over here especially countries like uh, singapore thailand have been known over here and uh, in terms of uh, development of uh, you know technology in terms of uh, coming up of economic zone they have proved to be very much beneficial between these countries then we come to sarc 
Now the SARC is the South, uh, the South Asian Association for Regional Cooperation. Uh, it is basically a regional intergovernmental organization and geopolitical union of nations in the South Asia. So its members include Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Nepal, Maldives, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka. And the SARC comprises about the 3% of the world area and 21% of the world's population and about 4.21% of the global economy as of 2019, that is 3.67 trillion US dollars. So it is quite a, a contribution from the SARC countries over here. And it has been seen that the SARC was founded in Dhaka uh, in Bangladesh on 8th December 1985. And its secretariat is based in Nepal, uh, the capital city of Kathmandu. The organization promotes the development of economic and regional integration between the member countries. And it launched the South Asian Free Trade Area in 2006, uh, wherein the SARC maintains permanent diplomatic relations at the uh, U United Nations as an observer and has developed links with the multilateral entities, including the European Union over there. <clears throat> the objectives of the association, as outlined in the SARC Charter, includes the following. Uh, it is to promote the welfare of the people of the South Asia and to improve their quality of life, to accelerate the economic, uh, social progress and cultural development in the region and to provide all individuals the opportunity to live in dignity and realize their full potential, to promote and strengthen the collective self-reliance among the countries of South Asia, uh, to contribute to mutual trust, understanding and appreciation of one's uh, one another's problems uh, to promote active collaboration and mutual assistance in the economic, social, cultural, technical, and scientific fields, uh, and strengthen the cooperation within the other developing countries, and also to strengthen cooperation among themselves in the international forums on the matters of common interest, and to cooperate with international and regional organizations with the similar aims and purposes over here. So uh, these are basically the objectives which majorly focuses on the development of the countries in the South Asia and increase the more and more cooperation between the countries. Now SARS in, uh, intra-regional trade stands about 5% in the share of the intra-regional trade in the overall trade of South Asia. Uh, the lasting peace and prosperity in South Asia has been elusive because of the various ongoing conflicts in the region and especially association of terrorism. So the political dialogue is often conducted on the margins of SARC meetings, which have refrained from interfering in the internal matters of its member state over here. And during the 12th and the 13th SARC summits, the extreme emphasis was laid down upon the greater cooperation between the SARC members to fight the terrorism over here so that there is more uh, economic cooperation, there is more uh, social benefit to the member countries of, of under SARC. <clears throat> then we come to the last uh, case study that is of BRICS. Now, what is BRICS? BRICS is a, actually an acronym of association of five major emerging national economies or the well-known economies over here, which are uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, which forms BRICS. So the acronym BRIC was first used in 2001 by Goldman Sachs in their global economics paper, The World Needs Better Economic Brick, Bricks, based on econometric analysis projecting that the economies of Brazil, Russia, India, and China would individually and collectively occupy far greater uh, economic space and would be among the world's largest economies in the next 50 years. So this has proven to be quite right over here because these are the leading economies in today's time, especially when we talk about India, China, Brazil, all these countries. All right. So it has been seen that since 2009, the BRICS nation have met annually at formal summits and the grouping was formalized during the first meeting of BRIC foreign ministers. And the first BRIC summit was held in Yekaterinburg in Russia in, on 16th June 2009. It was agreed to expand brick into bricks. So earlier it was just brick. So then there later on there was an addition. Uh, inclusion of South Africa at the brick foreign ministers meeting in New York in September 2010. So therefore it became bricks with the addition of South Africa. 
then the brics members are known for their significant influence on regional affairs and it comprises about 43% of the world population and having 30% of the world gdp and 17% share in the world trade uh then the brics members are all leading developing or newly industrialized countries but they are distinguished by their large sometimes fast growing economies and significant influence on regional affairs at all five uh, of their g20 members over here uh, also talking about the bilateral relations among brics states are conducted mainly based on the non interference equality and mutual benefit uh now currently there are two components that make up to the financial architecture of brics namely the new development bank that is the ndb or sometimes referred to as the brics development bank and the contingent reserve arrangement that is the cre both of these components were signed into the treaty of 2014 and became active in 2015 and ndb is a multilateral development bank operated by the five brics states over here uh if you know this uh, the the smart city mission project which is uh, in india to develop the hardest smart cities here the brics development bank has also provided loan for this so which is therefore the multilateral development bank which is operated by five brics states over uh, the bank's primary focus of lending will be infrastructure projects uh, with authorized lending of up to 34 billion annually so Uh, when we talk about the smart city projects it is associated to one of the infrastructure projects so definitely the brics uh, bank has therefore focused over here and they have lent it uh, for the development of this project all right so with this uh, thank you so much uh, we end this particular video thank you everyone